Well, good morning and welcome to Church Online. I'm so glad you're joining us today. In case you're wondering where I am right now, because this looks a little bit different, I'm actually on the stage of our new auditorium. And uh, next Sunday, we will be meeting in this space for the very first time in in in-person gathering. It's going to be phenomenal. I can't wait to see you. Uh, Really good news. I was just informed uh, just a few minutes ago that we actually obtained our certificate of occupancy for phase one, which means we are legally permitted to use our lobby and our auditorium. I'm absolutely thrilled with that. I would just encourage you, stay connected uh, to us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, our website. That will always have the most up-to-date information for you. I would really encourage you to be a part of that. And then, um, as I said, next week, a really big Sunday, and I hope that you're able to join us. We are having registration because we want to make sure that there's a seat for you when you come. So uh, you'll have information at the end of our service today about how you can go online and make sure you have a seat reserved for you. What I'm really thrilled about is that uh, right now, more space is even more necessary. Uh, We had no idea when we built this what was going to happen in our world or in our culture. And the good news is is that um, our extra space helps us in our mission, but it also helps us deal with the cultural realities right now. Uh, First of all, uh, we've prayed, we've planned, we've sacrificed so that we will have more space so that more people can experience God's grace for themselves. And uh, we're seeing the, the living out of that dream and that hope. So I'm thrilled that this is happening. Second, our increased space actually allows us to have more people in this room uh, with physical distancing in place. If we were in our uh, previous auditorium, that would be a very difficult uh, thing for us to do right now. And then third, we want to reflect God's heart as we gather in person to worship. I want to say that again. We want to reflect God's heart as we gather in person to worship. God is for people. He paid the ultimate price, and he offers the ultimate gift. He is for people. So this morning, I wanted to take a few minutes just for you to hear from this pastor's heart how we're thinking about regathering for in-person worship. And uh, The first thing I want to tell you is is that we can reduce tension by giving attention to the right things. I've noticed there's a lot of tension in our culture right now. There's quite a bandwidth of opinions, and people are pretty vocal about sharing them with one another. And unfortunately, in our world right now, uh, you can politicize anything, including a virus. And so our culture constantly calls us to choose between one side or the other. They want us to make a choice between one side or the other. I'm sure that you've experienced some of this in your own life. I actually think our culture prefers choices to conversations. We'd rather make a decision then we would have a conversation about it. Conversations expose you to some of the tension of of differing viewpoints. Um, But conversations are what matter. I'm I'm sure you've experienced this at home. Nothing really moves forward until you have a conversation with someone. Uh, You and someone else in your house may have very different opinions, and you can stay stuck in those opinions, but until you have a conversation, nothing's going to move forward. You can move away without a conversation very difficult to move forward without a conversation. A few years ago, there had been a big political decision that had been made in our country. And so the next Sunday, a person came into our church, part of our church family, and he looked at me and he asked if I was going to address that in my message of that morning. And I said, I wasn't. And he looked at me, kind of pointed, put his finger on my chest. He said, look, pastor, you need to tell people how to think. And or actually what he said is, you need to tell people what to think. And I just smiled at him and said, it's not really my job to tell people what to think. I think my role as a pastor is to teach people how to think. How do we think about the challenges? What do we consider? Uh, What options are available to us? 
So I'm not here uh, to tell you what to think. In fact, wherever you are in the bandwidth of social distancing and, and face coverings and everything that's going around in our culture right now, I'm not here to change your opinion about any of that. Uh, I'm not going to try to change your mind. Uh, I do think that how we think about coming back together is a valuable use of our time. And so what can we do in terms of the wisdom of Scripture and the leading of God's presence. How does that inform the decisions that we're making to come back together? So we are moving towards in-person gathering in our new space, prayerfully and thoughtfully. We've devoted hours of prayer into this. Your leadership, uh, our staff, our elders, our church family have been on their face before God for this day. And so we think this is going to be a phenomenal day. And we wanted to be thoughtful about it. We don't want to be careless in any way. God has entrusted much to us. We want to take that very seriously and be thoughtful about it. So I'd like to just cover quickly with you this morning five truths that are informing our approach to uh, coming back for in-person gathering. Number one, our first loyalty is to God and his kingdom. Our first loyalty is to God and his kingdom. Exodus 20, this is what God says. You shall have no other gods before me. Jesus would say it this way in Matthew chapter 6. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Luke 14 says it this way. You heard this last Sunday. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Our first loyalty is to God, not to a country, not to a political party, not to a denomination, not to a personality. Our first loyalty is to God. God calls anything that we put before him an idol. Now, you might not think that there's a lot of idols in our world today because you haven't noticed a lot of stone statues. We don't really create a lot of stone statues, but we are capable of creating a lot of stone hearts, very hard hearts. Hard hearts come from worshiping the wrong God. It's that simple. And so we live in a culture that produces idols. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an idol manufacturing culture, to be sure. So how are we to think about this? The way our church will process this season begins with putting God first. Secondly, we're called to love others as much as we love ourselves. We're called to love others as much as we are called to love ourselves. In Matthew 22, Jesus says this, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Um, I'm sure you have experienced what I've experienced in this COVID season. And that is a fair amount of confusion and frustration because the information that we get sometimes changes. Um, we hear one thing uh, about face coverings, and then a couple weeks later, it seems like something has changed. We hear one thing about physical distancing, and then we hear something else. And then we hear what people are doing in other states or in other parts of our state, and, and we wonder what is reliable, what is dependable. The question is, who are we following? And what I would encourage all of us is, is to follow Jesus more importantly than than any else we would follow, anybody else we would follow on social media. In our gatherings, face coverings are necessary. They're not a political statement. We're not choosing what political party or what side of an issue we are on. There's reasons that they are necessary for our gathering that are spiritual, not political. Uh, I just, um, I'm sure a number of you heard, uh, my mom passed away uh, last week. I actually had the privilege and the honor of officiating her funeral uh, last Monday. And uh, what I can tell you is uh, it, it was a, a very difficult and demanding day. And one of the things that made it hard is 
is when we gathered at the funeral home for visitation and then for the service, is that um, uh, we were wearing face coverings and hugs were not an option. And uh, there's some people I've not seen in, in 10 or 20 years. And it was something of a, a, a reunion. And people would walk in, and the first thing they would do is just open their arms wide up and just come running right at me. <laughs> and so I would just put my hand up. And, and you, we have kind of habits of, of interacting with people. And I put my hand up. And I say, I'm sorry I'm not able to do that today. And you could see the look of, of disappointment on their face. And I just told them, I don't know for sure that I don't have something. And if I do, I don't want to spread it to you. So today, let's just keep our face coverings on and we'll elbow bump. And that's what I did all day long. It wasn't easy. But I think it was helpful for people to hear that love changes the way you treat them. This is important. Love changes the way you treat people. If you actually love someone, if you actually care for them enough to be concerned about what could happen to them, then it changes the way we treat them. And the thing about face coverings, I know there's been some information, you know, they might not be the most effective in, in keeping us from catching something, but they're remarkably effective in keeping us from spreading something. And so that's why we're encouraging uh, face coverings. So that's why they're necessary when we come together. Uh, anytime you hear someone use the phrase, I don't care, uh, we, we might be hearing them acknowledge who they don't love. I'd, I'd like you to think about that. When we stop caring, we stop loving. And so there are ways that we can show our love, ways that we can show our care for others. So uh, face coverings will be necessary when we gather next Sunday, when you're entering, when you're exiting, and while we're singing. Why? Because we love others as we love ourselves. Third, uh, God calls us to respect government authority. God calls us. God calls us to respect government authority. Romans 13 puts it this way. Let everyone, let everyone, everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. God doesn't call us just to respect the authorities that we agree with or that we like. If we can only do that, then that behavior is a lot closer to something like a child than as an adult. Maturity enables a person, being an adult enables a person to do things they would prefer not to do. That's how we talk about it at, at our home, as we're adulting. Right? We're doing something we would prefer not to do, but it's part of the requirement. It's part of the responsibility. Less responsibility means less authority. I think we need more authority in our lives, more authority of God's kingdom in our world. And so that means we're willing to take on more responsibility. Fourth, being a Christian does not exempt us. Being a Christian does not exempt us. It doesn't exempt us from the laws of our land or the direction of our government leaders. It doesn't exempt us from some of the burdens and the inconveniences that come from the season that we were in. Every other institution, every other institution has been affected by COVID-19. Restaurants have closed, some of them permanently. Like there were places I enjoyed eating, and they're not opening again because they didn't have the economic capacity to survive this season. Uh, sports, like everything got shut down. Schools, all the kids were sent home. Hospitals, I had loved ones in the hospital I couldn't go see. I've had church family members. I can't get in to see them. It's been unbelievably difficult. Senior care facilities where people can't come in and out. It's just starting to open back up now. So the question I have is, what kind of message would we be sending to our community if we just said, well, I know that those businesses, those institutions, those organizations, those places, they have to close. We don't have to do that. We're exempt. I think it sends a very negative message to our community that somehow we don't have to bear the same burdens 
We don't have to take on the same responsibilities. And I don't think that's what Scripture teaches at all. Christianity is not a call to avoid suffering. It's not a license that exempts us from suffering. Christianity rather provides us the option of having resources available to us in the midst of suffering. That's the difference. So we have been able to meet online. I know. It's not the same. I would far rather talk to a room full of people than to a camera. Trust me. I would far rather see you than just see a comment that you post online. But I've been very grateful for the online option. It has been so good for us to have that in this season. It's been four months. Can you imagine if we'd had no way to stay connected for four months? I've got a little granddaughter. She just turned two years old a couple months ago. And, uh, and she lives 275 miles away. So you don't just drop by the house and, and see her. And uh, to travel for five hours with a two-year-old is a monumental task. So we do a lot of FaceTime. And uh, that's a, a video option for us to be able to see each other. And you might wonder if it's the same as seeing her in person. Of course not but it's better than not seeing her at all. And so while the, the physical opportunity to see her aren't that many times, I'm so grateful for the opportunity that I do see her. And it actually makes that time when I do see her physically all the more special. So I've been very grateful for the opportunity that we've had. Fifth and last point is that freedom means you have a choice. Freedom means you have a choice. 1 Corinthians 8, Paul says this, Be careful, however, that the example of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Be careful that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Freedom is never about proving anything to anyone. Uh, for example, we live in a nation that actually grants us a large number of freedoms. For example, the freedom to worship. The freedom to worship is not a requirement to worship. We have the freedom to choose the God we will worship and the freedom to choose the place that we will worship. The government does not impose that on us. We're free to worship, not forced to worship. That's a really big deal. Well, Paul was referencing an, a situation that they were facing in the church. Paul knew that he was, it was legally and morally appropriate and in, not in any way spiritually uh, uh, toxic to him to eat meat regardless of the source that it came from. Now, back in those days, there were lots of other gods and uh, idols, I should say, that people would sacrifice animals to, and then that meat would be sold in the common marketplace. And you would be able to know what God that was from. I don't know if, like if, if meat was served to this God, that maybe it was more expensive or less expensive, but that's how meat often came to the marketplace. And Paul understood that there were people who were believers who used to go to those stone statues, and they used to offer their offerings, the animals that would be offered up in sacrifice. And he knew what kind of spiritual flashback would occur if he kept doing that and kind of putting that out in front of them. And so he just said, honestly, if it would cause my brother to stumble, I wouldn't eat that meat again. He's telling us something very important. He's telling us that he's free to choose what to do in that situation. And he chose being with someone he wanted more than eating something he wanted. That was what was really important to him. Physical distancing and face coverings allow us to reduce anxiety in others. It's a sign to them that we actually are concerned about them and that we want to do everything that we can to make sure that they are safe. Physical distancing and face coverings allow us to show our love by demonstrating our care. If I have to choose between being with you or leaving my face uncovered, I choose to be with you. That's what matters to me. So if that means putting on a face covering 
when I'm entering and leaving, or when we're less than six feet from each other, or when I'm singing, then I will do that. Now, once again, I'm not asking anyone to change your political views or your opinions. But I am asking all of us to submit to the wisdom and the truth of Scripture for how we regather, how we come into this space. If we are unable to submit to Scripture because an opinion or political view is stronger than Scripture to us, then maybe that's an opportunity to spend some, some quiet, reflective time before God and to see if we have put anything before him. Now, next week is going to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be phenomenal. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to dance with delight uh, or if I'm going to weep uh, tears of joy. I'm not sure. But I do know this. It'll be great. It'll be great to see people with their, their hands raised and their voices lifted in worship of the God who has done so much for us has given so much to us and has entrusted us with so very much. Um, so we're going to come back together. And how we do this is going to have a real foundational reality for how we do ministry in the future. We are going to learn how to invite God into this space. In fact, I'm launching a new message series next Sunday about how to sanctify our home. How do we set this space apart for God's purpose, but not just the space we come to worship, but also the space we live, our home that we live in. How do we invite God's presence into that space? And how do we allow his purpose to be realized in it? So I really hope you can join us next Sunday. Uh, would you join me in prayer? Uh, Father, it's been a long four months We have missed each other so much. You have been with each and every one of us every step of the way. There were people who stayed connected, even though it required extra steps and, and learning technology, and all kinds of things. I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful for people's faithfulness to this house, even though they couldn't be here in person on a weekly basis. And so next Sunday, we're going to walk into this space. But you are our first invited guest. Already be here to welcome us in. We want to sense you from the moment we drive onto this campus. We want to sense you when we walk into this auditorium. We want your spirit to permeate all of this space. We ask that your presence would be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. I really hope you can join us next Sunday.